anytime I talk to someone who's about to make a low budget feature and they, they start saying like it's like a rom-com or something and it's just like oh don't please don't because you're going to do all this effort and, and no one's going to pick it up. This is Filmmaker Stories Podcast brought to you by JB Audio Post Production. Welcome back to the next episode of the Filmmaker Stories Podcast. Before I let my guest diving into telling stories, I wanted to let you know that we now have a Facebook group called Guess What? Filmmaker Stories Podcast. Go to the Facebook, type the podcast name in the search box and join the group. We post all podcast related content on there, but most importantly, it's a place for all first time real life indie filmmakers to share their own stories and experience. Being an indie filmmaker more often than not can be a lonely place. If you have a great, encouraging story to tell, share it with the rest of the community. Now, back to the podcast. Our guest storyteller on this episode is an indie filmmaker from Scotland, Graham Hughes. I was introduced to Graham by one of the podcast's previous guests, Luke Hale, and he said, if you really want to hear how to make an indie low-budget feature film, you need to hear Graham's story. I have to say, I'm so glad that Graham agreed to share his journey of making his latest feature film, Death of the Vlogger, with the rest of the community. In many ways, this film has been made by using textbook indie filmmaking approach, shot on the phone, edited on the laptop, and still managed to secure a distribution deal. The film is now available to watch on Amazon, go and check it out. And now, I hope you enjoyed the episode. When I was younger, I always wanted to do something creative, so I went through a lot of phases. I wanted to be a novelist for a while, and then I developed this like deep love of film, because my, my granddad had this huge collection of VHS tapes that he'd uh, recorded off the TV and we used to just watch films like all summer long I stayed at his at summer one of the first film jobs that I wanted to do was uh, Stuntman like at a young age it's kind of hard to tell like you don't know what a director is or a producer you don't know where like the boundaries are and a Stuntman's like this very visceral thing it's like ah okay like that's a that's a job I could do that <laughs> and then uh, got older and then found out what the, the different roles were and uh yeah, decided that I wanted to be more behind the camera and uh, directing and writing. So um, yeah, I started making films at about 16, 17, just done like a little mini DV camera, just like terrible, terrible student stuff. Just learned the craft and kept on making from there. Being a good director, I don't know if I'm there yet, <laughs> but I like to have that control, I guess. I mean, like that's directing next to writing it's you know where you've got the most control over the story and it's just uh the way to really implement your vision is kind of like wanky as that sounds but if you're gonna tell a story and and film then like directing's the the best conduit for that most of the first projects that i did it was just myself and maybe one other person if i could convince like one of my cousins to act in the film or my sister or my mum or that but it was just myself doing everything. As I said, I, I got a, like a little handy cam, mini DV camera for one of my birthdays and had like a laptop with just a movie maker editing software on it. So glad I don't have to use that anymore. <laughs> but yeah, it was it was just kind of like making home home videos essentially and just going on holiday and shooting everything on holiday and then editing little music videos with the footage when I got, got back and just learning as much about all of the like departments as I could like not knowing what departments were at the time just knowing that you know okay well if I film such and such and okay I'll need props and I'll need uh, makeup for certain points and lighting and just kind of like self-taught to an extent and then doing it at uni started to learn more about like fundamentals and a bit more formal education about it and was able to sort of combine things I'd learn on my own with uh, the right way <laughs> to do things. The first time I was actually happy professionally with a short film that I'd made was maybe about five years after I started, <laughs> maybe something like that. Like, you know, it's, it's all well and good just, you know, making little stop motion animations and putting them on YouTube. But um, it wasn't until a few years after that where I was able to show, I think the, the first short film that I was really proud of was this really pretentious, typical student film called Enlightenment. I was studying philosophy as, along with um, film at the time. And uh, I think it just speaks volumes about the mind of a student filmmaker is that um, I played the main character and ultimately the main character is revealed to be God. <laughs> you would have to come around to my mum's flat and find it in like a pile of DVDs. She's still got a DVD copy of it. That's like the only place it exists. It's been well and truly buried. 
I feel like I'm in a really odd place in the industry in that I like I, I don't necessarily know if I am in the industry at all as it is I, I feel like I'm still sort of that kids with the mini dv camera that's just making films with friends and family it's just that the quality's improved a little bit <laughs> and the scale and the scope of things um i've made three three feature films now each one's just sort of progressed in scale and scope and success but they're still very much like homemade kind of things my latest one death of a vlogger still you know literally made in my home made in my flat uh with friends and family and like the difference now is that a lot of my friends are actually professionals <laughs> professional filmmakers as well so that just adds up the quality and do you ever got like a, a distribution deal for this one and was biffa long listed so the sort of impact it has on on my career is a lot bigger but it's still kind of homemade filmmaking and i still feel very much on the outside of the industry so i'm in a sort of like kind of limbo at the moment i guess I think the the next project to take on will be very telling as to whether I can crack into the industry professionally or whether I'm still sort of like scrapping away on the outskirts, just doing my own thing and having some sort of crossover successes with, you know, festivals and distributors and awards and things like that. My first film was The Big Slick and it literally was made with a bunch of high school friends shot in our parents houses and just around our hometown and uh yeah it was just like such a scrappy effort and it, it was just something that we all found like pretty funny it was a, a teen comedy and we just yeah just sort of scrabbled through not really knowing exactly what we were doing and it turned out pretty well but ultimately the production quality wasn't high enough for it to go anywhere beyond that we won a BAFTA New Talent Award for the writing of it and that was enough just to kind of give us a confidence that like we were on the right path. So then the next step up was uh, our second film, A Practical Guide to Spectacular Suicide, um, which is a comedy drama and we took a sort of better approach to that one, a more professional approach and decided to get more people involved. It was a huge step up in quality from the first film but ultimately we hadn't thought of it from a business perspective and we had only really thought of it as like a sort of passion project and we just assumed that if we make something that we think is great then it will sell and uh, that's just really not the case a comedy without name cast is just like unsellable and low budget drama as well is just it's not a good uh, plan for the market and then uh, my third feature death of a vlogger i approached with everything I'd learned up to that point. So implementing all of the kind of production value type stuff and like making the most of the budget, designed it in a way that it, it would look much better for the budget that I had for it. And um, I also went the, the horror route, not just because I love horror films, but because low budget horror can actually sell and can actually make a profit. Um, you don't need cast and you don't need the best production value in the world. The horror crowds will watch almost anything they've got they're absolutely like ravenous of their appetite and they aren't put off by lack of name talent so that was again like a step up with that one and seems to have actually paid off this time so yeah with the budget for um my last two films anyway it's been incredibly low the first one was crowdfunded and the second one was self-funded the the main answer to how, how do you get a how do you uh, budget a film like this is uh you have to rely on favors really I was very lucky to have cast and crew that were either willing to work for very little or nothing at all. And um, I just made sure that basically just I wasn't taking the piss. I had the fortune of having worked with a lot of these people before and that they had seen the work that had come out and the quality was high enough that they trusted me and were happy to, to give me their time. But without that, a film like this could not be made. It would just be impossible. Um, and then the budget beyond that goes into things like travel, keeping everyone fed, music clearances, props is a big one, makeup, things like that. I see filmmaking as a business model now. My first two films were made purely for the passion of it. I was naive in thinking that they would be a high enough quality. You could essentially just ignore the market and they would sell. But I've learned those lessons the hard way that <laughs> that's not the case. 
So now, while I do look at it as a business, I would never make something that I didn't believe in. I think there's a happy middle ground where you can make something that's good for the market and something that you're excited about and a story that means a lot. Fortunately, so far, I've been able to make back the money on every film I've made just because they're uh, low enough budgeted. And I think the next project I take on, that will be the real kind of make or break. If I can wrangle a producer on board and get like some proper financing, then that's that would be the ideal scenario. But um, if it's myself again, just turning these uh, the profit from Death of a Vlogger into a new film, then it will really be me staking a lot of my own personal finance on uh, on a project, and it'll be make or break between whether I can make another film or not, whether the the film does well. Death of a Vlogger was conceived at the end of 2017, started writing it at the start of 2018, and the film was finished by about February or March 2019. So it was quite quite a quick turnaround, but it was that was mostly to do with the way it was shot, which is um, it's a found footage film or a mockumentary. So a lot of it was just myself in my flat with my phone, and I was able to kind of start shooting it before the script was finished as well. I wasn't entirely sure whether whether this would actually work, so I was kind of I wrote about half the script. I was quite happy with that, and I started filming it, just sort of testing it out, just to see what it looked like. I wasn't sure if the quality would be high enough, or it would just be like completely rubbish. So I was ready for the first like month or two. It's completely ready to pull the plug and just abandon it before I'd spent too much money. And uh, I just kept going, and I, I wrote the script along with filming it at the same time, and just kind of put more and more together. And I was editing at the same time as well. It was very kind of like iterative approach. Um, sort of just got assembled all at once. It was like pre-production and post all all, uh, all lumped into one. And um, after about two or three months, I realised that it was it was something that was like going to be a good enough quality, and I committed to it. And then yeah, it took about six months of piecemeal shooting. So um, I think if you lumped it all together, it'd maybe it'd be about fifteen days or something like that, maybe less than that. And it was just a case of um, every month I would send a message out to um, some of the actors and the crew and just see what their availability was and and then just schedule that around them, see what locations we needed. And because I've got a full-time job as well, it needed to be something that could be picked up and dropped at a moment's, a moment's notice. And um, it's, it's a stressful endeavour, so it needs to be something that you can like take a break from as well. It can be good doing that whole like two-week shoot where you get everything done in those two weeks but for this project, I was trying to make it as stress-free as possible. The whole thing, it was a brand new approach to filmmaking for me. About um, 80% of it was shot on the phone. I'd never made a, a mockumentary before or shot a whole lot on my phone before. But the results were much, much better than I expected. So uh, that, that was exciting. And being able to edit while I was writing as well, that informed the script. The, the script didn't get finished until about a month before the end of shooting. So that, I think, strengthened it as well because I could see what I had and I could, like, envelop... Uh, there was even, like, mistakes that I made in some of the early early shoots that I folded into the story and that strengthened it in the end, um, things that I wouldn't have thought to do. And it added even, like, twists to the story and it was just, like, a simple mistake that I'd made early on. I was like, oh, well, if I, if I change the script now, <laughs> then uh, I can... Uh, take that to an advantage. So it was, yeah, a really interesting re- approach. It was um, partly based on, um, I'd heard that Pixar do a similar sort of thing where it's very iterative, where animators are handed a shot each and they spend like weeks on a shot and then they'll do a little screening and they can uh, see how it cuts in and things. Um, and then if anything's not working, they're able to get their actors in to re-record lines and it's relatively, at least compared to, you know, as I said earlier, having like a two or three week long circus that you have to arrange with animation, you can change things as you go. And this film kind of had that sort of approach as well, just because the budget was so low and it was just my time for the most part. And things could just be changed and fixed a lot easier than normal. Because it's a mockumentary, I wanted to differentiate the footage that was shot by the main character that was like the archive footage of the documentary as it were 
I needed that to be differentiated from the footage that was shot by the documentarians in the story. So I had my friend Kevin Walls, who is a writer as well, but he's also a really great videographer and he has his own kit. He's got like a Canon C100, I think. So anytime there was scenes that were shot by the documentarians in the story, I'd ask him to to film those. So there's like talking head scenes that were all kind of professionally shot and lit so they would have a stark contrast between that and the phone footage. It's hard to say like the difference between being in London and making films in Scotland. I know a handful of people that live in London that are having a lot of success and I know a fraction of that in Scotland that are having some success as well but then the most successful Scottish filmmaker that I know personally is probably John McPhail but as far as I can see he's been kind of ignored by the industry in Scotland since then and his next project is uh, is an American project. I mean you only get like two or three funded feature films made in Scotland every year whereas the number is obviously a lot higher in England but I guess that's that's just one of the hard truths about it. That is just like an avalanche of horrible hard problems one after another. I guess the the main one is always funding because you know money doesn't make a good film, but it certainly helps solve a lot of problems. I mean, this kind of ties into that a bit. Also, finding a good producer. I've been looking for years for um, a good producing partner that I can work with, and um, inevitably always end up on my own. Like I said, I think those two problems kind of fold into each other. So hopefully, I can solve both of them with my next project. The more practical elements of filmmaking I, f I find quite straightforward now. I usually write things with a mind for low budget and I generally write things that I know I can make. So even from the script stage, I'm already thinking of locations and cast and effects and how to pull things off. Um, the project I'm writing just now, it's quite like effects heavy, but every effect that's written into it is something I know I can pull off that will look good on a budget. I've already got the location in mind, I've got cast in mind, um, even started thinking of music. So th these kind of things, it's, it's a lot more natural to me. It's the kind of like business side of the, the industry that I find a lot more difficult, but I've learned so much from the last film that I didn't know before and I'm starting to get a bit more savvy on that side. But yeah, the more practical aspects, that's, that's the fun stuff and this is problem solving and nine problems out of ten can be solved with a spreadsheet. My process for approaching each film now is just whatever's best for the project. The next film I do, I think I would prefer to have like a two week shoot and just get everything done in those two weeks and have a more traditional development, pre-production and production post. I've worked across most of the departments now. At least if, if I'm like, if I'm running a shoot, then I know the workflow and I know exactly how I want everything done. and. That's the main change from when I first started out. It was just an absolute shit show. Just trying to like muck through things and then making mistakes and then forgetting to back stuff up. And I've been working professionally in post-production for about 10 years now. So that was like a, a real baptism of um, efficiency and naming conventions and all of that kind of like structural stuff that's like the backbone of a good shoot and working as an editor as well makes you a better director and it makes you a better writer so getting a flavor of all the departments I think has just helped me become a sort of one-man band. I think film festivals are extremely important for indie filmmakers because I think it is all about who you know. It's just one of the easiest ways to meet people and to make contacts. In fact, the only time I ever feel a part of the uh, film industry in the UK is when I'm at a film festival, particularly Edinburgh Film Festival is one of my favourite places in the world. It's, it's one of the few times I do feel like a professional, just going and talking to people and being able to talk about my work and talk to them about their work. It just, yeah, it's a really nice environment, just kind of, it feels like validation. But beyond that, things do happen, like actual contacts are made. I have distributor and sales agent on my latest film because I met someone at a film festival. Um, and I don't know if I would have got a distributor or a sales agent without actually having gone to the festival. So I think they're absolutely invaluable. I mean, f festival strategy is like a whole podcast on its own. That is... Again, like I said earlier, that's a, that's a spreadsheet problem. So my approach is I 
have a, a column with the month and then a column with the dates that the film festival takes place over then a column with their submission dates usually we'll have like early bird and late then i'll have a column with the prices for submission um, again for early bird and late and then uh, i will just do a ton of research and like start with maybe some of the heavy hitters for indie films so Obviously, you've got like Sundance and South by, South by Southwest and TIFF. Usually, they probably are a waste of money if you don't know anyone there. But they're always worth kind of having a look at, just um, putting in the in the spreadsheet. Then there's the more niche festivals, particularly for horror. There's so many good um, horror and fantasy film festivals. And then just pop them in there and uh, kind of just doing research, finding out which festivals are good for marketing your film, which ones are good for awards, which ones get good audience attendance. And then it is essentially a numbers game, just having a budget for how much you want to spend, seeing which ones you can, hoping that someone sees something in it and you can maybe get a sort of snowball effect going on. Even with all of that, my festival run for my last feature was an absolute washout. I was able to afford about 45 submissions and I think I got into three festivals or four festivals over that. So really, really poor success rate. But again, like I said, it's, it's who you know. And I've since made contacts um, off the back of this film who have said, you know, you can come to me first and when you've got your next film and talk to me directly. And it's just a way of kind of getting past the gatekeepers because it's, it's not a meritocracy. Like there's so many factors to be considered, like who's in your film What's the length of it? Um, what other films does the festival have? What mood was the programmer in when they watched it? What taste do they have? Like, there's just so many factors that are all going to be against you before you even take quality into account. So, yeah, it's, it's festivals, it's submissions, it's a huge, it's a huge topic. But I think I've learned a lot about distribution since my first film. I think a lot of it is just kind of paying attention to the market and knowing what what sells and what doesn't and listening to people when they tell you because usually it's, it's easy to just bulk when a distributor or someone says like oh no you're this beautiful script that you've just written or beautiful film you've just made and you're like it's fantastic it's so good and they're like yeah well there's not a market for it and you're like no well you're you're wrong it's <laughs> it's so easy to just feel like that but um yeah i think it's, it's always worth listening because there's no point making a film really if people don't get to see it. I think it's a lot easier to get a distribution deal than it used to be, mostly just in terms of technology. Like you don't need to get a theatrical release anymore to make money or well, it's usually that's how you end up losing money. But even things like, you know, if you're submitting to distributors and sales agents, you can just email them a link. You know, there's no more burning something to tape or DVD and sending those out, which just takes forever and posting things and waiting for feedback. It's just, everything's a lot more streamlined. I think the the competition is still like massive. I'd sent the film out to, to loads of distributors and sales agents before I got a bite. And then on top of that, it's getting people to actually watch it as well. It's just like challenge after challenge. But I, I think it is somewhat kinder now than it, it, it once was. I've spoken to distributors and producers and got their thoughts on what the market is hungry for at the moment. And I mean, even then, like it's such a long process that by the time you've made the thing, then that flavor might be not wanted anymore. But I do take it into account as much as I think is necessary. I think as long as you're not shooting yourself in the foot. So for example, like I've had this horror comedy script on my shelf for about five or six years now, and I absolutely love this script. I really want to make it, but horror comedy just doesn't sell unless you've got name cast. Um, and even then, it's still a really tough genre to sell. So it's things like that that I think about for distribution, the kind of broad strokes that that's not a film that I can really feasibly make right now. I mean, I could make it. It's quite low budget, but it would just be a bad idea to make something that you're already a few steps behind. It's hard enough to get something distributed without making it even harder for yourself. I think not paying attention to what sells is a huge mistake. And uh, my first film, that was just a fun summer with some good friends and we made something pretty good by the end of it. But uh, yeah, like that was never going to sell. 
but the film after that we put so much effort into it but just completely ignored the fact that it was essentially unsellable so we put two years of work into this thing did a nice festival run and uh, was nominated for some nice awards and got us some industry rec- recognition but ultimately the film it didn't really get an audience and it's just kind of sad that uh, we, we were inexperienced so it's not like we weren't you know arrogant or anything about thinking that we knew better it was just we thought that we could make a good film and then you know that was that's the hard part and you would just sell it after that like just by dint of making one anytime i talk to someone who's about to make a low budget feature and they they start saying like it's like a rom-com or something and it's just like oh don't please don't because you're going to do all this effort and and no one's going to pick it up (laughs) i'm always thinking about audience like they're always at the front of my mind whenever i'm writing something or directing something they are the main concern because Without an audience, a film doesn't really exist. And even worse, if you make something that an audience hates, that's just like, it's just a huge, huge disappointment. I mean, ultimately, I'm I'm making something that I would want to watch and uh, hoping that there's people that share my taste. Anytime I write a scene or sequence or anything like that, I'm always thinking, well, what do I want them to be thinking and what do I want them to be feeling and what do I want them to be wondering and... Um, trying to keep the audience reaction in mind and I think that is really key to to my approach anyway. I think I do have a bunch of tropes and techniques that uh, I fall back on but most of the time I'm just trying to think of the best way to approach the story that I've written. So you know like Death of a Vlogger stylistically is completely different from A Practical Guide to Spectacular Suicide purely for the fact that one's a mockumentary and the other's not so I'm sure I must have cliches and things that I rely upon, but um, I can't think of any off the top of my head. Whip pens, I do like a whip pen. <laughs> but beyond that, I'm not really sure. Making a film now is, and getting it seen by people, is so much easier than it's ever been in the history of film. The camera that I shot my last film on is in my pocket right now. And I am talking to you using the laptop that I edited it on you know you don't need like a film camera and film stock and you know a qualified professional that knows how to use like a light meter to capture that and like a brilliant sound person and all this tons of equipment you can just sort of it's just so much more accessible now and the same with um distribution you could just put your film on youtube and then you can get it in front of thousands upon thousands of people same with uh Amazon Prime, for example, is completely accessible to to anyone. The only kind of barrier for entry to that is to have a subtitles file. If you've got time, it's just a text document, and uh, then there your films on. It's on Amazon, you know, sitting next to Transformers Four or whatever. The big problem is um, making people aware of it. Marketing is, as I say, a tongue in cheek, as simple as just knowing social media. So all of the tools are available in like relatively low cost obviously not free you need to have a laptop and internet connection and all of that but they're essentially free you can make your film just with equipment you probably already own then put it on a platform that's free to host and then market on platforms that are free to join i mean like i am being somewhat facetious but it is possible it's entirely possible so hard to tell like how covid will change things um again like kind of professional side of things uh, it's not something i've had a whole, whole lot of experience with so i'm not really sure how things will ch- change in that way with myself it's been actually kind of mostly positive for example there was a biffa scheme that i was invited to be a part of that was going to start at the end of last year and i wasn't able to be a part of it because it was all london based and now the whole thing's moved online um, so now I can be a part of it. So that's that's a bonus. I think the whole remote working thing is changing people's perceptions. I think it's not necessarily such a impediment now that uh, I'm based in Scotland. Obviously, it's not ideal, but it's it's been eased somewhat by changing people's perceptions on like how much you can do over you know Zoom and Skype and all that. So hopefully that aspect remains. Uh, uh, the UK is now kind of opened up. So yeah, fingers crossed for that. My next project is another horror, writing the script just now, and uh, similar to everything else I've made, I'm writing it in such a way that if all else fails, I can make it on my own with 
uh, money that comes in from my last feature. Death of a Vlogger's doing pretty okay with money, so um, there should be enough that everyone should get paid this time. It'll still be like absolutely a minuscule budget, but um, people will get paid and the film will look better than anything else I've made. It'll be a step up and I'll be happy with the, the progress of that. But I've also been lucky to make some contacts while I've made Death of a Vlogger and after it's been released. So I'm going to pursue some producers and some proper financing and see if I can actually make a professional film <laughs> for once <laughs> with, a, with a real budget and, uh, and actually get paid for it. That'd be nice. I'm just, I'm always scared to kind of put all my eggs in one basket. So if, if everything falls through, then I'll just be shooting it myself again next spring. Thanks for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed the podcast, make it known, spread the word, like it, rate it, and share it on your social media channels. Don't forget to subscribe and join the Facebook group. All links are available on the podcast show notes. Help filmmakers to make films and us to share their stories. Till next time.